Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our rectory study group. Give me just a second while I make sure that all my notes and things are there so that I can sound like I know what I'm talking about. And uh, we'll go from there. I'll just give people a few seconds to sign on and uh, see how things are going. Well, there's one person signed on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I thought tonight we would look at creation theology, and particularly anthropology and creation theology. It is in the church what's called seasons of creation. So it's the time where we in the Anglican church are encouraged to recall liturgically the the environment, the world. And in fact, what we're encouraged to do liturgically is to worship alongside creation, which is a very important theological move. So I thought I'd have a little look and, and introduce you to one or two theological perspectives on creation. And the first thing I want to do is distinguish between what's called natural theology and a theology of nature. Now, they, they sound like they should be the same thing, but they're actually almost completely different. So, natural theology says, if we look at the world around us, at everything, uh, what might we be able to tell about its ultimate origins, its creator? So, um, and you, if you've got the notes, uh, I posted the notes on Facebook a little while ago, and of course they're on the website. You'll see I've got there a picture of um, the art of making clocks and watches. Because one of the theological moves that is made is people make an argument that if you look at, if you were to come across a watch in a desert, and you were to examine it closely, and you see all the moving parts, one of the things you would inexorably come to uh, is that this clearly points to a creator. And in fact, a creator who has design skills and plans and who, who is an artisan. And so that's one of the arguments for God. Now, uh, so, so what we do in natural theology is we look... And we say, oh, look at the various different species and creatures. Um, now, we may understand that those have come through a process of evolution. And we understand that there is a structure that points to God that says God is creative and creates structures and architectures, in a sense, that are, you know, lead to an overflowing uh, abundance of existence. So that's natural theology. A theology of nature, or creation theology, is actually quite different. Because what that does is it says, oh, let's look primarily at Scripture, because Christian theology starts often from Scripture. And we say, well, based on what's in Scripture, how might we understand creation? And so obviously in creation theology amongst other things, the creation stories are very important. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, uh, the beginning of John's Gospel, all those places become quite important in our understanding of creation. So we're kind of going, what's our picture of God? And in that context, creation. And then for tonight, I actually want to focus on how do we understand ourselves as human beings, so that's the anthropology part, in connection to creation? So that's the, the overarching structure. What I want to do is just have, a, um, just have a quick look at a few passages in Scripture and how those then point to a theological understanding. And I've just entitled this The Entry Point. Uh, because it is, it is very, very much just an entry point into the, the vast topic of 
creation and theology. But it also represents a fairly, uh, if you will, a centrist, broad perspective. Most Christians would fit into this category. So, uh, if we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, what we get is we get uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Okay, now whether you read that as historical or as theological, and I would read it as theological poetry, uh, what you get is you get this idea that God has created uh, human beings in a particular and special responsibility uh, within creation. And part of that responsibility is to cultivate it. Uh, so, so farming is, and when I say farming, good farming is godly work. Uh, it, it's using the earth to provide food for others. And it is in accord with scripture. To guard it, to use it wisely. Um, and it's called stewardship. Uh, and so this would kind of lead to a theology of a stewardship of creation. It's a care of theology on behalf of someone else. Think of a steward in a castle. Think of a steward in a castle. You know, and the king says to the steward, you're going to look after the operational day-to-day -day while I go off and do my kingly duties. Stewardship. Well, in a sense, God has given us in stewardship theology uh, stewardship of creation to look after it while God is doing God's godly duties. It's a rough metaphor. Forgive me. But you get the idea. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Okay, so now we're actually starting to move in perhaps a slightly different direction. Um, so humans are given everything for their needs. Um, and what this could imply, or perhaps does imply, is that we can use whatever we want from creation for our survival. And so what that does is it kind of elevates humanity and takes the rest of creation and says, this is pri has a pr primarily is for your purpose. So in the Genesis 2.15, we've got primarily, it's our responsibility to care for it on behalf of God. 9.3, it's primarily for our purpose. Small distinction, but um, if you've ever tried to throw a ball and you get it just a tiny bit wrong at the beginning, it's going to go a long way off uh, further down the track. So it's important that we, we be aware of perhaps the implications of some of these. Uh, and then the next verse uh, that I wanted to highlight for you uh, is Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Now, you see, this is very much, in a sense, it flattens the picture of creation. In the first two pictures we've got, you know, there's a picture of creation and, and, and humanity is elevated above, you know, um, in the first one, we are there to steward it. In the second one, it is there for our use. In Psalm 24, blanket statement, everything that is, is the Lord's and all that is in it. Us, cats, dogs, mice, birds, trees, the whole lot. So it very much flattens. Uh, now, many people would suggest that that means that... Uh, it's our responsibility then to, you know, that thing, um, if you borrow something, you should return it in at least as good condition as you borrowed it. If you borrow a car, return it with a full tank of gas, those sorts of things. So uh, perhaps if we look at our environment and we keep some of these pictures in mind and we look at some of the broader global concerns at the moment, we might have some, some cause to, to ask ourselves about our theology. Okay, so that, that that's just an entry point, if you will. And it does get more complex than that. So the next thing I did is I got out my old uh, Christian Theology by Erickson, um, which was, I think, uh, published in 99, 1999, not 1899. Um, and he gives a, a very gentle, open-ended Protestant theology. 
Uh, and he talks about some of the creation and some of our theology. Now, one of the things he points to is a Christian idea. Uh, and he, he gives the, the scriptural justifications for the idea for creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now, uh, what he argues is that the doctrine of creation prohibits dualism. Now, we often sort of get this idea that some things are evil, some things are good. So, and, and when I say evil and good, in their very nature, you know, um, uh, and but a, crea a, doc a good doctrine of creation, which would include the creation of humanity, would suggest that there can be no dualism uh, because everything is created from nothing, which means everything is created exclusively from and by God's agency. And so there's no space for an, an, an intrinsic, in its very nature, darkness to come in. Now, light and dark, as a metaphor, obviously, light and dark, just in and of themselves, are, are very useful. And that has a theological implication when it comes to our anthropology. You often get this idea um, presented that when we talk about humanity, uh, we are talking about, you know, human nature uh, it's human nature to go to war. It's human nature to to uh, invent weapons. It's human nature. And human nature is often depicted in quite a negative sense. You know, it's, it's human nature to, to want to be fabulously wealthy. Is it? I mean, I, I know a lot of human beings who, you know, wouldn't mind being comfortable, but fabulously wealthy. Um, and Erickson points out that if we if we accept creation ex nihilo, and we accept that um, God says, you know, looks at all of creation and says it is good, then we have to be very aware, or at least reticent, to to blame evil actions on human nature. Human nature. Is good. That's what that's what God said in the Bible. You know, there are other questions that need to be answered. Absolutely, creation ex nihilo definitely needs to uh, explore uh, the a theology, if you will, of, um, of of evil and things like that. That, but if in in that theology, the other thing that Erickson points out is. We then start to have this, and once again, this is that flattening idea that I pointed to earlier, that there is an interconnectedness of all creation. Now, I mean, I can remember when I was um, younger at school, we, we spoke about the, the food chain. And there's this idea that, you know, um, uh, like ants ate dead animals and then... Birds came and ate the ants, then eagles ate the birds, and then snakes ate the... You know, and you worked its way up to usually a lion, because I grew up in South Africa. Uh, and then the lion died, and that fed the plants and the ants, and, and it created a chain. These days, kids are taught about a food web, recognizing that it is far more intricate than just a, a circular chain. And there is a theological uh, dimension to that. In that... Uh, if we see all things as being created by God, uh, as part of a, uh, a creative act and an ongoing creative act, uh, then we see all things as being connected. And not just in a kind of in a, in a food web sense, but almost in, a, in, in the sense of family. And as soon as you start talking about family and creation, uh, you have to recall um, Francis of Assisi, who is, is, amongst other things, recalled as as preaching to the birds of the air and the and the beasts, and and, and talking about you know wolf as a brother and and birds as sisters. Uh, and I thought what I'd do is I would track down a little bit of that. 
So we've got one of the verses in what's called the Canticle of the Sun. Now it's S-U-N, not S-O-N. Uh, it probably isn't the kind of mistake you'd make in another language. But anyway. And this one is, is attributed to Francis. We praise you for all your creatures, especially for Brother Sun, who is the day through whom you give us light. He is beautiful and radiant with great splendor. Of you, Most High, he bears your likeness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Um, and, and so you can see a, a, a spirituality that is born out of a deep theological understanding of the interconnectedness of all creation. Now, I, I would like to see a lot more of that. But, okay. So I'm going to keep moving on. Just, you know, in case, in case we get bored or something like that. And I want to move to something that's actually slightly darker. Uh, and, and by darker, I mean less optimistic, less optimistic. And I was put onto this most recently by the work of an American religious writer and researcher, uh, Tad DeLay, in his book called Against. And what he does is he explores some of the trends uh, that are shaping American, because he is American, culture. And one of the things he does is he works with research from uh, a group that you can access called Pew Research. I used to think it was called Pew Research because all the research I came across it had to do with churches. And so I thought it was, oh, like, it's, you know, it's the view from the pew. Uh, no, it's named after somebody pew, and they do research in a whole range of areas. But there you go. <laughs> Um, they do very good, uh, broad, st lots of statistical research. So if you ever want to know about these sorts of cultural trends. One of the questions that comes up, that they asked, is... Uh, um, mo you know, expect, do you expect Jesus Christ's return to earth? And... That, that wasn't kind of in an, in an end statement-y type thing. That was in, uh, I think it was within one generation, if I recall the, the, the page that I got it from correctly. You can jump on and check. Um, and so what you get is some 54% of Protestants said it will probably happen. Um 32% said it probably won't, uh, and 15%, I, I don't know. I mean, and technically, in one sense, we all don't know, do we? But, you know, uh, but when you kind of start to split that up, you get the white evangelicals say, with 58% saying it will happen. Uh, and only 27% uh, from mainline Protestant churches. In America, the, um, the Episcopal Church, which is basically the Anglican Church, is considered to be a Protestant tradition. 32% of Catholics said it'll happen. Uh, and 20% of unaffiliated uh, Christians said it will probably happen. Now, what that means is that you've got over half the Christians and nearly three-fifths of the white evangelical Christians saying we pretty sure Christ is going to come again within perhaps our lifetime or at least the lifetime of our children. So what does that mean? Well Tadele points out that that means that you don't really believe in a future with a long horizon. Um, you know, uh, you, 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 you would suggest the earth has a horizon of, say, 40 to 60 years. And beyond that, it no long, is no longer time bound. Whereas if you think of, you know, science fiction writers and uh, a whole range of other people, they would suggest that the earth has a horizon of hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions or possibly even billions of years. 
Uh, and so you get a very different horizon of time and a very different situation of ourselves in time. Add to that, or alongside that, is a large number uh, um, who say who, talking about say global warming. Now, when they say so, global warming one of the big kind of scientific issues at the moment. Uh, and if you look at the white evangelical community there, you're looking at twenty eight percent would attribute global warming to human activity. A third would suggest that it's just a natural pattern, and a third would say there's no solid evidence of global warming at all. So you've got two-thirds of the white evangelical community basically saying there's no such thing. So human beings are not causing global warming. If you start to look at some of the more mainline traditions, you know, 40% of uh, would suggest that human activity. If you look at black Protestants, you're looking at 56%. So, uh, and if you're looking at the Hispanic Catholic Church, you're looking at 77% are, are attributing global warming to human activity. What that means is that if you don't take something like global warming seriously, and you don't take uh, a, a theology that says we have a stewardship responsibility of the earth seriously, and you don't believe in a long-term future, then what you can come to is a theology that says the earth is ours to use in whatever way seems fitting to us in this moment. And we don't need to worry about the consequences because there will be no consequences. Jesus comes again in the next 30 or 40 years. Who cares if in two or 300 years the temperature is up and there would be flooding everywhere? It's not going to happen. And so what you can get is a very much, a much darker theology of creation and how we re relate to creation. Now, I do want to say, I'm putting this in there not because it's a dominant view, uh, it's it's not um, even within America. It's it's not the dominant view, um, but within certain significant influencing places, it is. Uh, does that make sense? So, uh, but I I think we should be aware of it. Where would I stand? Because I think that's that is an important question. I would probably actually, going back to the entry point, for me, I would look at Psalm 24 verse 1 that has that almost flat view of creation uh, that sees us as being absolutely part of creation, part of, uh, and having a responsibility to, you know, once again, uh, to use, you know, if you borrow something, you should return it in at least as good a state as um, as you borrowed it. Uh, that with maybe a little bit of kind of stewardship idea. But, uh, yeah. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So, I, I'm going to say, are there any questions or anything that came up for people that you'd like me to try and answer straight away? Got a couple of people sort of here. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, thank you, Simon. I'm glad that you found that very interesting. Well, that, that seems to be it for now uh, in terms of questions. So what I will do is I will say good night. Oh, so no planet B then? No. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Well, what's that? Um, is the T-shirt uh, that says, you know, as far as we know, Earth is the only planet with coffee on it. Protect the Earth. Um, or you can put donuts or whatever you want in there. 
Uh, no, no planet B. Um, at least, look, maybe in the fullness of time, but yeah, I'm not, ex uh, I'm not expecting divine intervention in the, in the um, kind of brute, brute force sense of the word uh, in this one. So I'm going to say good night, thank you, and um, I will pop it on YouTube and link to it on the website later on. Bye.